To get a sense of Emirates Airlines' global growth ambitions, you only have to look at its order book. It has 377 jets on order, and it currently flies 250. It is the world's biggest airline by international traffic, but is working in a very difficult environment. Yesterday, Emirates Airlines launched to Boston. Today, we're talking to President Tim Clark about his phenomenal growth ambitions for the company. My name is Rory Jones, and I'm a reporter based in the Middle East. Helping me quiz Tim, I have one of our veteran aviation reporters, Doug Cameron. He's in Boston. And trying to give an independent view on the proceedings, we have Andrew Charlton, an aviation analyst based in Geneva. Now, we also want to hear from you out there. If you have any questions for Tim Clark, please do speak the matters at WSJ or at WSJ Middle East. And you can also use the Google Hangout Q&A app to ask a question. Now, let's dive straight in. Tim, this is your 140th destination worldwide, Boston. You've got plans to, to, to fly 70 million passengers by 2020. That's almost double the, the number that you flew last year. So how big can this airline actually get? Well, it's a question I'm often asked, and I have been asked that for probably 10 years now. If you roll back to the early part of the last decade, people were saying, when are you going to stop, or what size do you think you can get to? And at that point, we were at about uh, 70 or 80 aircraft, with uh, probably about 60 destinations. So here we are in 2014, with 214 wide-bodied aircraft, and 140 destinations, the one that we opened yesterday. And the, we've already announced a number of points that we're going to be open during the course of the next uh, operating year. Um, the fact that we have ordered that number of aircraft, um, uh, which um, includes the new 777X, which doesn't come out until 2020, uh, of which we ordered 150 of those with 50 uh, purchase options. At the same time, we ordered uh, 50 more A380s, taking our total order block to 140 of those uh, aircraft. So, of course, it suggests that we are not going to stop and we will continue to grow our business. You've heard the figure of 77, you've mentioned it by 2020. At the moment, we're carrying a million passengers a week. Um, and that's likely to continue to, at this rate of growth, and the, as we grow the hub and we connect many more uh, cities in the world that we're serving, or we increase production on those cities that we are serving. Either through more frequencies in through a gauge change, if we take a given example, uh, we started the Los Angeles route with a 200 LR, 777, 266, now operating with a 380 of just under 500 seats, and it's full in both directions. So as we, we, we extend the fundamentals of our original business, which is one that sees international city care connectivity in a manner that has never been uh, conducted by any aviation entity in the past. Um, and if that continues to be a success, measurably so, um, we will continue to, to do more of the same. And our plans through the next decade um, see more of the same in US operations, theater of operations, South America, uh, Africa, Asia, Europe, and of course, Oceania as well. So it, it, uh, it's a global, um, uh, very aspirational uh, strategy. It's one that we have been successful in executing since we started. Uh, and unless other external sources come into play that inhibit what we do, we'll do more of the same. You mentioned the external focus, then that's a good point to bring in that uh, you're certainly admired in the industry. For you for your marketing, and, and as you well know, you're also uh, facing fierce criticism alongside your Persian uh, Gulf rivals who some people believe you do enjoy unfair advantages. Whatever the merits of those arguments, are there inhibitors going forward where the, the aeropolitical, the bilateral regime between governments that you've enjoyed that allows you to, to uh, operate more flights, is there a danger that could be rolled back and that could actually inhibit the current growth plans that you have? 
Well, there's always a risk of that. And, uh, you know, apart from a few pockets of aeropolitical resistance, so we, we haven't been able to grow up for whatever reason that the governments that are uh, not convinced that we are doing the right thing for their particular countries, their economies, that's their, their opinion that we respect that. Um, if you look at the European markets that we operate, so and since the middle of the 90s, most of the five, we've had quite a growth of resistance from multiple uh, entities within the European markets. But if you look at where we were then in 95, and you look at where we are today, having just opened up over the Great Haven, we have 37 to 29 points in Europe on a very high frequency operation with very large aircraft, which we is doing very successfully. Stockholm has, has uh, which came produced the goods for us, taken home and another. So, in answer to the question, yes, there are concerns. Um, I think unfairly, uh, uh, unfair positions have been taken. Uh, we, we do our level best to persuade the government that we are doing with that. What we, are, what we represent is a value for money proposition. Um, we have enormous enterprise um, <laughs> and the cities that we fly to. We have uh, many people who champion our cause. I mentioned the Mayor of London, Boris Johnson, who is particularly keen on what we have done with regard to the geographic domain, etc. And many countries value what we do and have done and will continue to do. So. I think there will always be the detractors, there will always be the resistance, there will always be those who what we do. If you look at what we have done, basically we've grown really from being that successful. Andrew, from your perspective, how much is what Emirates is doing driving the strategic thinking of perhaps every other airline on the planet? I'm sorry, I really didn't hear that. Was that for me? Okay, given Emirates' growth and scale, Andrew, how much uh, how much influence do they now wield in the global industry, and how closely do uh, other airline executives watch what Emirates is doing? It's it's frankly impossible for any other airline not to see Emirates and not to notice Emirates. There are a number of issues that Emirates have chosen, or a number of strategies em Emirates have chosen to take that are extraordinarily positive for the air transport industry but are likely to upset a number of the incumbent players. And Emirates has been a, a force for liberalisation in the air traffic and aeropolitical regime but exactly as Mr Clark says, I, I'm sorry, so Tim says, I think that there are going to be issues where they start to bump up against pockets of aeronautical resistance or, aer aer sorry, aeropolitical resistance. And one of my questions then is, how does how do you see the future of the, uh, the the aviation policy framework? Do you think that we're going to continue with the sort of Chicago-based exchange of rights, or, or will eventually will airlines like Emirates and indeed Etihad and Turkish and others force that door open so that we end up with a much more liberalised environment? Well, if it is to be known, the Liberalisation of era politics was a phenomenon that really started in the mid 90s through the early part of the decade. 9 11, of course, um, inhibited that for a period of time. But as the global economy became a truly knit economy, um, so there was a realisation that the old predeterminist thinking with regard to era politics had to change. If people were going to market, if people, if the new generation of, for instance, the smaller, medium enterprise entrepreneurs are going to be able to move around and do the business that they want to do in the same way, that's not a question of them, okay. but the quantum of new business that let's take the tech industry, IT, etc., that has come to market in the last 15 years, there was a recognition that liberalization of um, access and the removal of restrictions was critical to the way these economies were going to grow. So I think, and we harnessed uh, our business model for that. And in fact, if the truth be known, when we designed the business model in the mid 80s, it required a rethink and a re uh, channeling of the aeropolitical uh, thought processes in the, in the world as, as they stood in 1985, very pre 
And I think in our small way, we were able to convince governments, Australia was one of those, that allowing us in once a week on a charter basis via Sydney and Melbourne, as it was in the early days when we made applications fly there, to now nearly 100 points a week, many of those are 380s and multiple points in Australia, has demonstrated what we have done and what we can do for other places and what the aviation industry can do if it is allowed to operate and develop in an unencumbered manner. After all, one has to look at all the multinationals, whether it be telecommunications, whether it be information technology, whether it be oil, whether it be power and utilities. These have all become multinational corporations. Foreign ownership is welcome, etc., etc. The last bit of the of your thinking of the post-war era uh, is aviation, and today there are still vestiges of that, which we hope will eventually break down. Um, and people will, and, and, and countries will recognise how important it is to the way they go about their business and what they're trying to do. So, in some small way, Emirates, I think, has probably helped in doing that. We are a change agent in the aerospace, aeronautical in, uh, aviation industry. I, I don't look in the, I've been in it a long time now, and I look back and I don't see many Emirates types coming along. You would have seen the growth of hub operations in the US, domestic hub operations, um, and the way that started to grow post deregulation um, in the US, and how that is now consolidated, etc. Et but on the international scale, in my view, I would say, wouldn't I, that this is the best thing for international aviation, the best thing for the country that embrace that little bit of things that they might be. Where will it take us? I think the pace at which it happened, the pace at which people like ourselves grew our business successfully, the point at which the incumbent carriers didn't adjust their business models to the reality of the 21st century has caused friction and tension. Those that have adapted, and at the time that we've been going, growing our business, look what has happened with the low cost. I mean, in the old days it was Southwest, her plan has set this thing up, and it's got a revolution going. Actually it was started by Freddie Laker in 1974, I would say, but never mind. Um, now the low cost revolution, the low cost entity within the aerospace industry, you know, now like 30, 40 percent, it's growing in double digit in Asia today. So whether the governments like it or not, the push from the aviation sector, the push from the, the business people, the traveling to try and get value for money, low affairs, etc., are highly uh, productive entities. It's quite clear to them all. Tim, can, I jump, can I jump in there, actually? I just want to ask a, I just want to ask a business model related question that we've had on uh, had via Twitter. It's something that you get a lot, uh, Tim. It's a question that you're 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 asked often. Um, it, this this is coming from uh, from at def fifty five. What level of subsidies for fuel and finance does Emirates get from its sovereign owner? Can you uh, can you answer that one for us, Tim? Well, um, in answer to both questions, there's none whatsoever, um, and that's, that's a categoric no. We have had no uh, financial subsidies, no fuel subsidies, uh, any subsidy you like you may choose to think about, we have not had the benefit of those. I say benefit, I wonder whether they are beneficial. If we started receiving subsidies, it would, it would skew the business model, it would skew the management, it would skew the DNA and the culture of the company, which is one of hard commercialism, requiring it to produce a profit, keep cash positive, and grow the balance sheet at the level it would, so we can send debt to the balance sheet when we need to to finance the future economy. We do not have the course, we do, have, we do not have safety net at all. We have to make our own way. And a lot of a lot of people and entities out there, given what aviation has been, don't forget, aviation, international aviation has emerged from state ownership. It was hugely subsidized. They were run, run as part of the civil service. And they haven't really done a particularly good job since they came out of that. And there are still many carriers today that aren't making it. They're very large. I won't mention names. So they cannot understand how we can do that and be profitable without state involvement through subsidies, etc. And I can say categorically, that's not the case. Let's, uh, let's get Andrew's view on, on, on that as well. Um, 
Andrew, uh, what the, the the state subsidy <laughs> argument is is something that were we, the the Emirates has dispelled uh, a while ago. Although its its books aren't, aren't, aren't sort of open for all to see, and there are other Gulf carriers like Etihad and Qatar who um, are also labelled with this this state owned, state backed uh, name. I mean, what's what's the view in the industry on this? I think Emirates have done a good job of convincing the industry that they haven't had the benefit of cheap fuel and other state subsidies and, and I think that the right thinking sections of the industry accept that. But I think the, the other aspect of it, and it partially relates back to our first conversation, Emirates has put an enormous amount of eggs in a single airport basket and that airport is provided by the same owner as Emirates which is the government. Um, there, there are people who would argue that the, the, the implicit subsidy that Emirates gets from the, having an airport that will do whatever it wants to do or whatever Emirates wants it to do is a very, very valuable thing and a very, very valuable asset. Leave aside its ownership, there is no question that, that, that Dubai Airport uh, is a very valuable asset for Emirates. And so my question actually is, do you think you've got too many eggs in a single airport basket? Um, well, the first part of that, Andrew, with regard to what the state does and doesn't do, I mean, where, do where does this end? Um, what about the roads to Heathrow, or the roads to Shanghai, or all the, the, the infrastructure that, that goes into supporting and supplying an airport, many of those state owned? I don't know uh, where this is going to end. It's interesting that it's a north from Straight subsidies, uh, no fuel pricing, uh, no uh, fuel payments, uh, uh, you know, no um, landing fees, no handling fees, etc. Et it's moved away from that, and each time our detractors find another way. There is no income tax, there's no corporations tax. We have low labour costs, etc., etc. All these are deemed to be subsidies in some shape or form. What they tend to ignore is that in this country, in the United States, where we're sitting at the moment, there's a thing called Chapter 11, which doesn't exist in other parts of the world. Those carriers that entered Chapter 11 for the first, second or third time in the US would long since have disappeared off the aviation net and gone bankrupt. They were protected by state laws, which allow them to operate unprofitably in a bankrupt manner. So, you know, what is that? That has to be a form of subsidy. We've also had the protection of many carriers today through their airport. They are not allowed. They do not allow it to their because they're concerned about their own national carriers, which, by the way, are in the private sector. So why are they still continuing to protect those carriers? It can go on and on and on. It's a path that's not worth really. China are an implicit subsidy. Hey, how, how much time have you got? Because the uh, the labour costs in Asia are significantly lower than they are in the West. Is that a subsidy? Some people would say it is, and therefore the game, the, the, the playing field is level. Well, I'm sorry to say that has to be the big stuff. Um, as far as the airport in Dubai is concerned, eggs in one basket? No, I, d I don't think so. Um, yes, the government rep is one of the few governments in the world that recognizes the criticality of aviation and what it is trying to do. Very important. 28% of GDP is all about aviation. And therefore, they recognize the need to grow the hub to a point where it can uh, uh, allow the business, not just from the Emirates and from Dubai, but from the foreign carrier community, who are also anxious to grow their business. So yes, they're trying to grow. We have another airfield in the south, the Dubai. Central Al Almat Two International, which is under major development now, so it's big. It will be the next seven or eight years. Um, built uh, to come out. Tim, you, you were switching subjects. You, you flew in from Dubai yesterday into Boston on a, a Boeing uh, 777 200LR, uh, which is uh, yours with the the type of aircraft involved in the, the, the mysterious disappearance of the, the, the airlines aircraft. How do you, as, a, as an airline executive, uh, react to what is obviously the, the concern, both of current and possible uh, potential passengers? Like, 
it, it's just the biggest mystery yeah. in the industry is because the story is the industry. How do you as an airline executive and you as an airline industry react to and um, react to it? Well, it's 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 a dreadful story. Um, you know, for for friends and relatives not to know what is happening, uh, to be in a position at this point in time must be absolutely dreadful. And I, I can't I can't think of any other word for the people who have been caught up in it. It's an absolute tragedy. As far as the incident is concerned, it remains a complete mystery. 777. Is one of the best uh, uh, wide-bodied aircraft that Boeing has ever produced. Its track record is, is exceptional. Um, it is hugely popular with the airline community and the people who are traveling. For it to disappear without trace is an absolute mystery. And uh, I sit here watching as you guys will be looking at the news, trying to get information from the entities involved, whether it be the NTSB, Boeing. Uh, the Malaysian authorities trying to find out what has happened, um, but uh, we, we, you know we'll get to the bottom of this. Of course, we always do. There hasn't been a, an aviation incident in history, and I can name quite a few uh, of the same type of thing where we haven't got to the bottom of what has happened. So we've just got to have to bide our time and let the investigations take their natural course, and our thoughts go out to those poor people who are desperate to know what's happened to their. To their Friends and family. The incident has, uh, has, has raised an, an existing debate in, in two areas. One, the uh, the ability of aircraft to uh, uh, to communicate in real time, be it with the authorities or be it with the airline, uh, and secondly, uh, a much broader debate over over the ability of passengers uh, to communicate with each other uh, or with people on the ground. Obviously, very separate to the incident. But if we if we take the first one over uh, the ability of aircraft to communicate in real time, is there a cost issue which the the industry has to address in terms of uh, installing equipment uh, which has satellite communications, for example? I I I think the industry and the airline community uh, spend an awful lot of time and money developing all that kind of communication equipment to ensure that the aircraft are tracked, um, that they can be located in this particular case. Um, I cannot speak to catastrophic failure for whatever reason. If that happens, then then uh, you know we are as lost um, as we are with this particular incident. But the modern day aircraft um, is um, when I compare it to the the aircraft of twenty or thirty years ago, we're not talking about the same same entity whatsoever. The the level of um, communication equipment, as I said. Um, is so far advanced that we can track every single movement of every single aircraft wherever they may be. In our network control in Dubai, which resembles a mini NASA, I can see exactly where any aircraft is at any point of its journey during the course of a day. I can find out who's on it, where they're going, what the pilots are, what their licenses are, what the speed of the airplane is. We can we can monitor all the aircraft propulsion systems and aircraft systems in general through the uh, engineering group that we have in this uh, this uh, control center, command and control center. Um, so the level of uh, interaction between the aircraft and the ground is second to none. So unless, as I said, there was some catastrophic failure which prevented, in this case, the ability of the pilots or the aircraft systems to communicate with its uh, ground equipment, then um, I, I, you know, I'm not saying we are, we're not going to continue to, to improve, but there is uh, we, em we embrace and employ technology to the highest standard, the highest level, to ensure that we know exactly what is going on all of the time. Passengers obviously want to get there safely. That's that's paramount, and that's paramount for, for your business. But uh, they also want to uh, they also want to be entertained. They want to uh, communicate, and maybe we even want to be comfortable. Who knows? As far as the communication issue goes, Tim, how well do you think the industry is is serving customers in terms of providing communication? Uh, Facilities which uh, both you know keep someone happy without annoying someone else. Yeah, uh, well, it's a, it's a drum we've been banging for 20 years. We've been really at the forefront of developing uh, in-flight communications, whether it be telephony, uh, more recently on the internet. Um, we have resisted very strongly the uh, pressures to exclude the use of mobile phone date phone uh, devices on the airplane, um, and we introduce hardwired phones 15 years ago onto the airplane in each seat. 
Now we have uh, the ability to use your own mobile phone on our aircraft um, and communicate as you would do if you were on the grounds. And also we are developing the internet functions to such an extent that, I mean, we, you know, we, we do not have the bandwidth to be able to stream as much as people would like out of YouTube when you've got 500 people streaming at the same time. I think that's a, a, a quantum leap which we may not be there, but most of the people can communicate SMSs, emails, etc. So they can do a modicum of interaction with the um, internet, uh, social media. Can I ask, but, a, um, I'll ask an, another question, if I may, uh, from Twitter? Uh, a little bit uh, off, off topic here, here, Tim, but something that we've had a number of people email in about. Um, this is from Kamir Bhatia. He says, does Emirates fund early stage mobile tech startups focused in the travel space, um, or would you partner with, with such a startup or, or look at or doing something in the entrepreneurship space? It's a good question. Um, <laughs> I have to say we're, we're awfully focused on trying to do the right thing with regard to the way tech technology, dare I say, is moving, uh, particularly in the communications field. Um, and at the moment we're trying to align our reservations, our distribution uh, thinking with regard to the, the way things are going to be done now and will be done in the few years. So there are multiple entities that have come to us offering their services and partnerships with regard to developing that. But at the moment our concentration is changing out the way we distribute our products into the new way, um, and there is clearly a new way. The legacy systems of of uh, distribution have had their day, and we have to move on. So it's a it's a path that is not clear to us. I don't think it's clear to many people. Yes, there are multiple startups uh, in this area, and and of course the smart ones will get traction, and they'll bring their goods and services to to market. Again, it's hugely it's hugely competitive, but. Um, for us to pick one or a group of one or a cluster of, of entities would be um, something I'd be quite interested in doing, but whether or not we would take my mind and my colleagues in the management off the, the main squeeze of trying to get this business growing at the pace we are. But believe me, we are very alive to the fact that you know we need to do more in that particular field. This particular tweeter has is, is kind of hit the spot in many areas. Andrew, for, from your perspective, how, how do you feel that... Uh, Connectivity on board and, and so we say the mobile friendliness of, of an airline business will, will become one of the sort of key competitive advantages or disadvantages for, for airlines going forward. Uh, I think there are a few aspects to that, Doug. Um, I think that it increasingly will become standard that, air, that airlines will offer on board connectivity, and I think as people as the population grows younger, as, as more and more people become completely conversant with the way in which the internet works and what have you. I heard someone the other day say that for the under 25s, the internet is like water for fish. They don't even know it's there. They can't see it, but if it, but if it, was, if it was to disappear, they would die. And I think the concern, the, the requirement for continuous connectivity will get higher and higher on the passenger side of the cabin. And, and so I think it's inevitable that we will go down this road. That leads us into the next bit, which is what happens with the, uh, with the internet more generally. And I completely agree with Tim that the legacy distribution systems have had their day. And I think we're watching the start of the disintermediation of the distribution of the product. What I don't know yet is how that's going to go. I do know that Google, for, by way of example, not your traditional startup, but Google is spending a lot of time and money looking at travel distribution at the moment. Uh, Emirates has put its product onto the Google platform. Uh, so has Ryanair, very interestingly, and I think that's a really fascinating development. Uh, then the third aspect of all of this, of course, is to cut back to the Malaysian uh, situation or the safety issues. We have this interesting, difficult situation where the connectivity in the cockpit is different to the connectivity in the cabin. And most of the time, 99.9% .9 of the time, we, we're happy that the connectivity in the cockpit is more tightly regulated, is in a different band, allows for complete what's called safety of life communications, because the last thing on earth you want is for an, AT, uh, for an air traffic control message to be interrupted or distorted because someone's downloading a photograph onto Facebook in the back of the cabin. But arguably, last week with Malaysian, it might have been beneficial if we 
if we'd merge the two communication bands. The, uh, the issue you raised earlier, Doug, of the cost of the equipment on board the aeroplane if we were to have continuous streaming, that's not an issue at all. It's not the cost of the equipment, it's the cost of the constant requirement to download massive amounts of data and the spectrum requirements. But to, to wrap all that back up, my, my view is that in, this is inevitably the way of the future. Like water for fish, the, the passengers are going to demand more and more connectivity. I think airlines are going to have to give it what we've always seen with any product improvement on an aeroplane, and I'm sure you'll agree with me, Tim, is a bit of a leapfrog. One airline offers it, the next airline has to, has to offer more, and then more it goes, and on it goes again. Um, we're also seeing this sort of product being offered as, as aircraft get more complex. So I think Andrew, it's just I'm gonna, Andrew, I'm going to jump in there if I can, because we're, we're running out of time here. I just want to ask uh, one last question, really, of Tim, because we've, we've been going for some time. Uh, Tim, as you're, as you're well aware, a facility has opened in Abu Dhabi called a pre-clearance facility that allows uh, passengers to board a plane in Abu Dhabi and essentially touch down on US soil having cleared customs. Are you in discussions about getting such a facility in Dubai that will help Emirates? And do you see that, that, that becur becoming an issue for you in your expansion and for for carriers in the U US uh, seeing criticizing that facility? Well, take the this in reverse order. Yes, the American carriers do see it as, as a competitive advantage given to, in this case, Etihad in Abu Dhabi. Uh, I understand that there is a dialogue between the government of the US and Dubai with regard to establishing something similar to um, what's going on in Abu Dhabi, possibly even in Qatar. Uh, beyond that, I don't really know where it's got to. But don't forget, when you do set up a pre-clearance facility, um, it is an extremely difficult uh, entity to manage, given the nature of the multiple flights that we bring in that feed our US operations. For instance, yesterday when we came to Boston, 39 cities served the, 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 the flights that took off yesterday. They had uh, citizens from each of those cities, many of whom would have had to have visas to get into the US, all of those would have been taken from multiple gates across our three concourses, brought to a central location, effectively sanitized once they go through the US border and customs, and held and then distributed back to the airplanes in a clinical sanitized manner. That gives us enormous issues with regard to below wing and above wing transference. So in some respects, it's great because you ease the pain of the consumer, the passenger. On the other hand, the airline has to face a logistical nightmare to make it work. I'm not sure the benefits are that great, given the scale of what we are doing into the US at the moment. The trick, really, is for the US government to restore its uh, human resource and information technology resource to its entry points so that it can meet the requirements of the consumers who want to come into the US and have to go to the controls. Surely that's the way, rather than move them out. I mean, it may be slightly simplistic in my thinking, but this is all the result of um, a shutdown, a close down of the resources that have gone into border control and customs protection in the US. Okay, and Tim, one final, final question then. Uh, you've been at uh, Emirates for a very long time now. Will you ever look at retiring in the near future? Ah. What can I say? Yes, I've been there a very long time, since the beginning, um, and I, I guess I'm getting to that age where people are saying, when are you going to retire? Well, I guess when uh, Morris Flanagan left uh, in April last year, he was, I think, in his uh, early 80s, 83, 84. I'm not saying I'm going to get to that level. I think I will try and stay as long in this job as I can continue to create and add value to what the business does. If, it, if there comes a time where I will know that I'm not doing that, then the time is to hand over the reins to, to a younger group of people. But I'm absolutely sure that in the company today, we have a group of managers who are perfectly capable of taking the business on when I'm gone. So whether I go today, tomorrow, or in a year or two's time, I'm fairly relaxed about the succession plan. Okay, great. Thanks so much, Tim, for joining us for this Wall Street Journal Google Hangout. And thanks to Doug Cameron in Boston also. And thanks to Andrew Charlton in Geneva. Thank you all.